Hello. Quoi Moi, je prends celui-là. Please. Moi, je me mets. Team. Juste après, euh, juste après toi. Take a seat. Good morning, or maybe I should say uh, good uh, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Jack Word and welcome to this uh, session um, organized and animated by Dassault System. And uh, we are pleased to be with uh, one of our partner um, Coriolis Composite today. Thank you very much. And I will just introduce this session, and uh, I'm going to then hand over to the team who has a very pragmatic illustration uh, about uh, what we do. And um, I hope you know the Dassault System first. Maybe I, 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 I should start with that. You know, for more than 40 years, uh, we were creating the company in 1981. Uh, we have been um, partner of the uh, aerospace sector automotive sector, industrial equipment uh, in the last 40 years uh, to do what we call um, virtual twins, which is uh, creating uh, parts, assembly, products, and uh, a lot of things that uh, you find uh, on the streets, cars, a lot of things that you see in the sky, airplanes, space, are designed, simulated, produce with our software. We are a $5 billion uh, dollar company, and our strong motivation is to build a scientific foundation, technology foundation, to help our clients, uh, aerospace OEM, automotive OEMs, uh, to design and simulate in a very e efficient way and, uh, and, and quickly. So we diversify the a lot in uh, three different sectors. So I told you about our success in uh, automotive aerospace. This is what we call the manufacturing industries. Uh, but we are also present in two other sectors. One is constructions with uh, complex infrastructure. So whatever it's a uh, nuclear plant, wind power plant, uh, all sorts of energy uh, uh, facilities or constructions, uh, buildings, bridge uh, are done with, with our software, and also life sciences. So the same way we want to do the virtual twin of cars and airplanes, we want to do it also for the human uh, being. So why are we here today for this um, uh, composite show? Because there are three main design trends which are guiding us in terms of investment. The first trend is about sustainability. And when it comes to sustainability, you know that one of the big uh, objectives is about light weighting. Uh, make sure that all the different components of an aircraft, of a car, is more and more lighter. And obviously, composite is playing a, a big part of it. That's topic number one. Topic number two is design automation. The capacity for uh, all the brands of Dassault System, Katia, Simulia, and Delmia, to accelerate the design cycle, to make sure that we can help our customer on time to market, quality, cost, is, is, is very important. So that's, that's the trend number two. And the trend number three is about systems. Because all what we do now is not just uh, about mechanical design, right? It's about a combination of mechanical, electronics, electrical, softwares. So system is a, an integral part of it. So now when it comes to composite, and you will see a couple of experts from, uh, uh, from Dassault System telling you about that, what, is, what are our priorities for uh, development related to lightweight materials and composite? Number one is to have an end-to-end -end approach a seamless integration from concept to manufacturing. So when it comes to CATIA, which uh, 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 it's about designing, but we partner with uh, uh, Simulia for simulation, with Biovia for material studies, and with Delmia with manufacturing, where we have a collection of brands that does the system, and really the goal is uh, uh, to make this end-to-end. -end. The second priority is mod sim. What we call ModSim is combining the power of modeling 
and simulation together. Why do we want to do that? Because we found out that, especially in the, in the early phase of development, a lot of uh, things that people are doing is that they are testing a, a bunch of alternatives in simulation tools. And we want to make sure that we have the right integration between modeling and simulation so that every time an engineer is evaluating a new alternative for composite parts, very quickly we can get the feedback in terms of simulation. And the last priority is about materials. Because the optimization of um, uh, designing a part, an assembly in composite, is not just about the way you design it or the way you produce it, it's about what kind of, um, what is the most efficient material you're, you, you're going to use uh, for your design. So these three priorities are guiding the overall uh, things that we do in our products. And uh, this is what we're going to present right now today. So again, maybe I, I should have started with that. Uh, that was my introduction. My name is Olivier Sapin. I'm a CEO of Katia. Uh, and I will hand over to uh, Daniel, who will uh, introduce to you the agenda for today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Olivier. And thank you for attending this uh, session. Uh, I am the uh, loyal guy today. So the guy who will take care of presenting you uh, all our stuff. So let's start with the agenda. So uh, the bad news for you is that it will last one hour, 15 minutes. So I hope you will enjoy the show and not <laughs> be bothered too much by, by what we'll uh, talk about. So after the introduction again from Olivier, uh, our big boss, uh, I will uh, be very, very pleased to, um, for you to get an information of, from a guy working on a field with customer with trying to solve the, the issue of the customer, Etienne, and he will present what we can do today with our solution. So very pragmatic stuff. Then I will hand over, and we are very lucky because, you know, R &D, the R&D development team of the composite solution is very close to here. It's maybe 60 kilometers. So R&D is, is here, and I'm very happy to have also some R&D guys in, in the room here. So it's, a, it's an honor for me. And R&D will talk about what is coming next. By the way, it's coming so next that it's already there. What we can do in the concept, at the concept stage of designing a um, composite part. And then we'll talk about manufacturing with Francois, uh, when it's uh, about um, automation of the manufacturing of composite parts. It's a very important topic. Finally, as um, Olivier said earlier, if you don't master the material, the product, and the process, you are missing something. So you need to master the material, the product, and the process. And for the material, if you can go very, 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 very deep in the nanoscale of the know-how of what is happening to the material, you will be able to feed the right mechanical properties to the macro scale level to do the FES simulation of the part. And this will be also covered by Stephen. If we have time, we will have a small Q&A session, and I will finish by the conclusion. And now I ask. Etienne to, to join us on stage. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, um, yeah, there we go. So let's start with the first part of the presentation, of the presentations today. Uh, we'll go with composite engineering, modeling, and simulation. So I will start to describe you the current status, what we have to answer the current status, and then Pierre Yves will follow up and show you what, where we are going to next. Uh, so let's have a look at what we call the current disconnected silos of information. Uh, so typically this is the world that I grew up in about 25 years ago and which is still today uh, the fact in many companies where you have a design engineer on one side, a simulation engineer on one other side and also a manufacturing engineer on another side. Each one of the, those people, uh, even if it's the same person, are using different software. And if you want to exchange information going from the design world to the simulation, stress or loads, you, you don't have any common ground. So you end up having to exchange data back and forth and usually not, I mean, it's very tricky to exchange those data. Those are really silos uh, in the sense of silos where you cannot connect them. 
uh, the axis systems may not be the same, so it's especially true for composites where you have lots of referentials that may not be the same and when you go in the FEM model to the Ketia, uh, to the CAD model and going down to the to the manufacturing. So if we want to go a little bit more closer into this segmentation between the modeling and the simulation, so mod sim, uh, you can see that we can exchange data between let's say uh, Ketia or SolidWorks uh, over into a FEM tool like Abacus through step file or directly with the with the geometry information and we can start to exchange the data back and forth using some neutral format so abacus input tech file or layup file as well which is a technology that we have uh, developed internally at the so system i mean that we have internally at the so system and you can of course use all those legacy approach excel spreadsheets screenshot powerpoints so those workflow are disconnected uh, but we recognize that this is, there is still a need f to address those workflows. So we can do that. We actually are proposing some solutions that are really helpful to support those workflows in a nice way. To take a Nastron or Abacus input deck and import that into Ketia to generate directly in 3D all your boundaries, all your areas corresponding to those sections. Uh, you have all the laminates created automatically in the software. What we can do as well, we can export, uh, take the input file uh, from the from the three experience platform, and we can import that, and we can export it as well, respecting all those uh, all those properties as defined in the software. But where we want to go really is not to provide a direct just the answer to the current state of the art. Is really to propose a new process. This to be process where instead of having back and forth between silos of information, we want to have really the design that would be driven by simulation. So simulation driven design very early for the preliminary design and also later on as we go into the detailed design. And same thing very early integrating the manufacturing constraints in the design process and all the way into the manufacturing support and providing a feedback loop. Uh, of the based on the quality and based on the actual manufacturing, based on manufacturing operation management. So having all those people connected is really what we are proposing with our software. So if we just dive on what is mod sim in our software, is basically instead of having those input deck files used to exchange information back and forth, well, it's much better to have one common reference that's used to feed the modeling, the simulation models at different stages of the design, whether you are in the conceptual level, detail level, or later on when you have the actual manufacturing definition. And if we place that in the overall concept to production, so the mod sim stage that we are talking about are just the very first bullets of the entire process. But as you can see, so the entire vision of what the 3 experience platform does for composites goes all the way from requirements, so systems engineering level, all the way into production with the ability to simulate the resources and generate the production data, which is what Francois will talk to us, uh, will mention more in depth. So today, uh, my portion of the presentation and Pierre is as well, we are really in the first two, three steps, you know, sizing optimization, preliminary design, and design virtual testing. So this is really where we want to focus today's presentation, but there's much more to that that the platform can do. So how do we start? Like I said, uh, if you have two silos of information, well, maybe your referentials are not the same. So the most important thing is when you are on one unified platform, in the three response platform, you need to set up your referentials in the same way. So the first step is to use one common material. So you have your source of material that can be fetched directly from a library 
that you define in your database. And those materials have different facets. So they may have like the source of the supplier. Who are you going to buy that from? Which price maybe? Uh, and you have also all the composite properties, so the thickness of the material before curing, after curing, uh, how drapeable that fabric may be. Um, so all those manufacturability information. And you have of course the structural properties which are captured inside this unique material that's used in this parameter. Then we're going to decide which orientation we want. And those orientations have to be specified in an axis system that we call the rosette. So the rosette we have, we are proposing in Ketia versus the rosette in the FEM world, which is usually just a Cartesian system. The rosette in Ketia can be defined based on an axis system. So, but the very good news is once those references are set up for the model, it's digging is going to be the same reference used for the designer, the simulation guy, and the manufacturing. Going further into the referential, we're going to uh, now specify the laminates. So the laminates, this is actually how we define how many layers we want in one given area. So those laminates can be specified very roughly using thickness ratio. So this is uh, one of the new capabilities that we have in 3 experience. Thank you Pierre even the team for that. Uh, the thickness ratio corresponds to a very early conceptual approach. Basically you're going to give the the targeted thickness and you're going to just give a percentage of orientation uh, for a given material. And then uh, from, from that, the software will find out what are the actual number of layers corresponding to that. Or you can specify explicitly the number of layers, or you can so explicitly specify which layer comes first, one by one, for how many layers you may have in your laminate. So those laminates, as you see, are not yet plies. So they are just the conceptual view where which are basically coming from the stress requirements. So what we have in Kitia as a framework to support from sizing to detail design, this is something that we call grid design. So this grid design is actually allowing you to have reference elements which typically are coming from the assembly requirements. And based on those re reference elements, you're going to have geometric areas which will be assigned to laminates. So those laminates correspond to uh, the stiffness that you want in each area of your skin panel, for example, to support the loads. And dressing all that up, you're going to form the plies which are then used for the manufacturing. So typically, in a nutshell, going from preliminary design, the mod sim early stage, into the detailed design where you actually have the plies where you specify which ply comes first and which is dropping over completely. Uh, so once we have that model defined in based on the geometric world, we are going to map that over to the FEM. So in the typical nowadays world, this approach would be to say, okay, I'm going to start from my FEM and I'm going to define my properties on the FEM, on the, on the mesh. And then I'm going to ask the designer to figure out what I'm going to do, how he can create his plies, how he can manufacture them based on my FEM. So here we suggest this other approach. We start from the CAD uh, and we generate the FEM based from that. So the FEM can be done directly on the surface or on a separate surface and we can map the composite properties over onto that FEM. Once the mapping is done, effectively we can visualize all our layers. So we can have this thickness plot that's going to give us the information on how the laminate is distributed over on our part. So we have our FEM that's high fidelity model. Uh, you retrieve all the useful pre-processing information like the ABD stiffness matrix. You can actually also have this concept of ply when the ply are, are visualized at this level. So the stiffness matrix as well. And you run your simulation and you can, so the value of the platform is you can run a simulation not just the good old linear static but you can actually run some much more sophisticated simulation. Like for example in that example you have a bird strike that's run with SPH uh, that's based on Abacus explicit. So that's something that's possible in the platform. Uh, very relatively very simply you can actually even make a template of such a simulation in order to run it more efficiently. 
But yeah, so this is really the state of the art that we have, and we are going step by step into bringing more and more simulation capabilities into the hands of the designer, and also trying to bring more and more capabilities in the hands of analysts in order to combine all the worlds together. So here on this example, you can see we are visualizing the fiber direction as computed by the design engineer. So this is the, the network that you can see here with different colors, blue, yellow, red. When it's red, that means there's very high sharing, and when it's yellow, it's low sharing. But those, those directions here are giving you the direction of the fibers, and I'm super imposing that with the stress plot. And so here I can actually check if one given ply as its fibers align with the stress the main the principal stress is direction so that allow you to consider to maybe change your manufacturing strategy in order to improve that given ply for a structural performance so we are really tr this is the one of the the most uh, the most exciting things with this platform combining all three actors together in one place is you can really rethink your process and optimize your manufacturing strategy based on simulation results or vice versa, having simulation taking into account manufacturing and all that as design, design engineer being the, the cornerstone of the entire workflow. And so yeah, so all that to come to, this is the state of the art, what we have today and what we are going to have very soon. Now Pierre-Yves will present us what's coming. Thank you, Etienne. I forgot to present you Etienne. So Etienne is, uh, of course, uh, a Katia guy, but he's uh, coming from the west coast of North of America, where he's taking care of our big customer over there. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Etienne. Thank it was crystal you, clear. <laughs> so, um, Pierre-Yves? Well, so, um, you, you the want, mic is yeah, yours. You want to say something? No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm fine. <laughs> well, uh, hello, woman. I just have mine. Oh, yeah, I need that. Thank you. Well, so how we can move to... Um, earlier phase of the design. I mean, we, we took a lot of decision uh, early in the process. So how we can move that? We need to find a way to use all the components that Etienne has been showing uh, in a way much faster for uh, analyst people, which are mainly using this. So we have been developing a new role, which is named Stephen Structure Concept Design Engineer. Um, the challenge is how we can define and manage uh, Stephen structures. So what is the Stephen structures is actually what we see mostly everywhere. We have an external panel which is coming from just an ID or coming from CFD analysis. We have an external shape and you want to create a structures on the top of that. The structure will be a combination between um, some reinforcement you want to introduce and some materials that you need to introduce. The materials could be composite, but it could be not composite. In that case, we would focus on the composite things, but <laughs> the challenge is the same. We need to be able to do trade-off between composite material and non-composite material. Um, we need to balance between several types of reinforcement. Uh, so the reinforcement can be stiffeners, but could be materials with core, so we could have a thick external shape. And we need to run quick FE analysis using all the previous capabilities. So this new world um, is embedding in a single workbench some capabilities from design, modeling, and simulation. In this world, we imagine that you have an external shape coming from a CFD analysis, for example, and the CFD analysis provides an external pressure and first uh, proposal for the external shape, and you need to apply layer of materials on that. So you need to define on the surface some areas uh, which are cells part of the grid, which is an already existing component, and we need to do that quicker. So selecting the surface you want to consider, you can easily split it using geometrical tools to be able to define some area, the cells, to attribute specific laminate which has been defined in the composite parameters. The idea is to have a thickness distribution over all your structures quite quickly. Uh, this mechanism using uh, our composite design tools is taking more time because you need to define uh, from design point of view all the split loop one for the geometry. So it's a very easy tool to define. From that composite material definition, you need to create the mesh. The mesh can be constrained by the boundaries of the cell or not. 
Uh, and from that, you use the transfer the design properties to the simulation to be able to get the composite properties that you will use for a simulation. Could be a P comp, could be composite properties, either one. And you recover in that position all the plies that you have been previously defining in the laminate. So we'll have all the off axis, all the zero degrees, and you can review that and the stiffness matrix related for each area of the structures. So using this quick firm definitions from the design, you can, on top of that, uh, apply the pressure coming from the CFD analysis previously done and perform a structural analysis. You get the result on displacement stress, and you can get decision uh, with that process. In the case you would like to do something more coarse, uh, because you really want to explore a single concept or very uh, simple concept, for long structures, you can imagine to use the same design, but you don't want to create a studio shell structure, which is actually quite detailed already. Uh, you want to create a stick model using the design information. So you can just use a straight line. Along this straight line, we will have cross section being used to compute the mechanical properties of the equivalent B model. And the B model will be populated automatically from the design information. Uh, into the structural firm analysis. It means that each time you change the laminate, it will update the one firm model. So you have a control on the firm based on the design for very coarse simulation. You again apply the load, which is a simplified load, uh, and you can run analysis, which is therefore running much quicker compared to the shell analysis. And you can get retrieve the stress from the information you get at the cross section uh, using the quadratic moment information. So this role uh, is renovating all, all the definition which have been done in that uh, structural analysis. All the, the, the commands you need to do that are really part uh, of a single workbench. On top of that, because we have an automatic process, we can perform some uh, exploration and optimization. So if I try to sum up, Based on one single design, you can choose either having a very simple FEM representation using stick model, or you can have a 2D shell more accurate representation, or later on 3D uh, solid ply-by-ply -ply representation in the case you want to observe out of stress uh, uh, information. So using the same design model, you will be able to update the FEM model. So this is really the value, and you can create some stiffness to explore uh, iteratively the process. So, giving some principle of the rules is we try to boost the multidisciplinary engineer, engineering between modeling and simulation. How we do that is we have this single new app containing all the needs you, uh, you would have for structural analysis. So it's really a tool for uh, helping the analyst people coming on board the platform. And we have some specificities uh, related to one DB mistake model, being able to create structural simulation. Uh, and perform loop and optimization. To show you all more complex uh, things, uh, in that case, we try to highlight that the grid previously defined a very simple example. Uh, it's not necessarily square cells. You can have more complex shape of the cells using reference line coming from a topological optimization. This is the case of that study. So uh, we have the full videos of that, that project uh, on our booth. You can have a look there to see how we perform the topological optimization and get the output back to create the, the, the grid. So we really easily set up uh, the boundaries of the cells and the materials we want to apply to each cells. And we're working also to uh, be able to define the laminate in a very different way than just defining laminate per area, but you would like to define some plies. So new things are also coming based on the same technology. So we easily, in what quite a real time, two minutes, being able to define a baseline because we have the existing reference line for the study. We can, and that case, you see, we can actually use the existing laminate or create a new one. Well, it's just uh, quite straightforward, but we have connected tools between the composite parameters and all the features used. Also, for the one beam, uh, I have been showing you just very simple example on the blade, but we could imagine that more complex structures could be managed the same way. Uh, so here we have just multi orbit with just straight line existing, and the design model has been done. And using the design model, again, we create the feature for each part of the boat. Uh, and then uh, we have a stick model, which is defined accordingly to the accuracy we expect. 
So the equivalent shell model is about uh, 2,000, uh, 200,000 elements. The stick model is about 100 elements. So it really changed the time of simulation and therefore the time you need for uh, any exploration. We connect the different beams together using some coupling elements and apply the loads on each part of the structures accordingly to what we will be doing on a 2D shell structures. And therefore, on the top of that, we will get some results responding for the displacement, having a view of the writing moment. So it's coming a bit later, talking too fast. Uh, so the load case is just to represent the fact that we have a mass and some loads on the cable. So quite realistic cases uh, to see how the structure is responding. And we introduce some water pressure uh, on the Lee water hull to get it. So the simulation is running in about 10 seconds. And we get the result of the displacement first. I don't know if you see, yeah, it's getting better. Uh, we have the displacement, and we can review also the, writing, the momentum along the structures to see how, which are the peak corresponding, of course, to the connection to structures. So we have many tools for the process processing, helping the structural analyst to get the response of how we could bend the structures, how much we can. And those outputs are store a uh, referential output that you can use for, again, any optimization. And because we have a single design, uh, we can switch from this tech model to the 2D shell model, just being because it could be run at the same time, so we can compare the result of the two simulation complexity. We can do one beam, we can do 2D, uh, but we can do both of that, and this is the idea. In some area of the structures, you will only need stake models, but for example, on the blade, you will need more accuracy for the roots of the blade, so you would possibly need 2D or 3D for the roots of the blade for the two first meters, and then switch to one the stake model, using, again, the same one single design existing in the structures. So this is part of the new world. And I've been talking a lot about optimization. Uh, the optimization should be done in three steps. So we have tools for topological optimization. Uh, functional generative design uh, is helping to explore using uh, our topological solver how a volume could be uh, considered from stiffness, um, from structure point of view. We get the output from the functional generative design with some thickness distribution. And from the thickness, we try to create equivalent uh, layup laminates over the structures. And then we need to uh, see how those laminates should be uh, shuffled to get some correspondence to the plies. And we are working with some partners, uh, Collier uh, Aerospace, actually, to make working new solution uh, to improve the optimization on top of that. Um, optimization could be done well through laminate, and this is because we have an automotive process. So we have uh, some tools in the platform which offer you the ability to explore also the same way. So two, words, uh, two apps, sorry, simulation, optimization, and process composer, which offer you to automate the process and run optimization and combining the expertise of our partners and the existing of the, the models in the platform, we can actually iterate between the information stored in design and CD effect on the simulation side. I think you want to conclude on that part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre-Yves. And this is the father of the product. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. He's not alone. He has his team with him. But um, um, just three takeaways. I would just take 10 seconds. Remember, if you have to remember three things. First, it's a tool for stress analysis, but an easy to use tool. Don't need to be a Katia geek to, 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 to use it. That's important. Second takeaway, it's a hybrid FEM model, modeler. You can do 1D and 2D. And if you use 1D beam approach, you can converge much more quickly to an optimal solution because obviously the computation time will be uh, faster. Okay. And finally, it's very important. The concept that the stress analyst is designing very quickly can be reused by the detail designer in the Katia composite detail design application. You don't throw away, you don't start from scratch. So this is very important. Now I would like to get on stage and on the mic, uh, Francois, and we are now to talking about the, the, the real thing, the manufacturing. The real thing, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Francois, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I will. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm Francois Meloco. I'm in charge of the software activities at uh, Coriolis. So if you're, you're not familiar with Coriolis, we're uh, mainly a machine vendor uh, company. 
we build uh, and, and sell uh, machines to produce uh, composite parts. And the main technology we, we have is the is AFP, Automated Faber Placement. So this is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Whoop, I've got to slide this. Yes. Um, OK. So I'm just going to, to explain how we see from the manufacturing side uh, or the, what's, uh, what's happening in the, in the global process when, at the end, the, the part is produced with, uh, with AFP. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the part or, or, or the, uh, the project starts with the, the conceptual mechanical uh, definition. Uh, then it moves on to preliminary design. All this is optimized and, and uh, iterated with the stress departments, the analysts. Uh, from there, you move on to uh, the detailed design. Uh, in, in, in it's also known uh, for in the in the, um, the South Systems world is uh, Katia Composites or, or CPD for those who are familiar with it. And at some st some companies also iterate or validate the design at this stage with the uh, with a, a validation loop with the uh, with the with the stress department. And this is what we from the manufacturing world uh, call the uh, the uh, analysis and design worlds. Okay. And then you move on to uh, the AFP programming with, uh, with uh, solutions such as the one that we develop in partnership with the Dassault. We call it, it's called CAT Fiber. So it's really a programming solution. So you do the design, the AFP design, and the AFP simulation with the, uh, with the solution. And you, move, and you send the programs generated by such solution to, to the machine itself. Okay? And this is the manufacturing world. So on one side, we have an optimization of the mechanical properties uh, of the part. And on the other side, you have an optimization of the production of this part. But today, regardless of all the, the efforts and all the tools, and uh, because, as mentioned, we're saying, you're usually using separate tools, uh, they are still separate worlds. And the impact of, uh, of uh, separate worlds like this is that the design is optimized without considering uh, manufacturing specificities. Okay? And on the other side, we're, we're uh, considering the uh, manufacturability, manufacturability of the part very late. And the design is usually frozen at this stage when, you're, when you, uh, you, uh, you come to, to try to produce at least your first part. And the programmers have to do uh, whatever it takes to produce the part. Okay. On the other hand, to avoid and to, to minimize uh, the, the risk, you have knockdown factors for analysis, you have engineering rules to, uh, to take into account the, 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 uh, the, the, the manufacturing difficulties, but you're not considering the right, the, the exact data that you, that you will be uh, producing. Um, Typically, the orientations, the gaps, and things like that for AFP are very important, but they are considered as knockdown factors and, and engineering rules. Uh, and these rules, on the other side, are very restrictive because uh, you're imposed uh, fiber orientations, you're imposed gap positions, etc., and you can't reach the optimal AFP design with such uh, constraints. I've always been surprised that. I'm, I'm coming from the, I uh, haven't mentioned that, but uh, I used to work for Dassault Systems and working on the uh, Katia Composites application, the R&D. And uh, knowing this well, I was always surprised that on the manufacturing side, you discovered uh, the, the, uh, you only had the, the uh, orientations, the rosette, and that was it, and you had to do with it and a set of rules. Uh, and the impact of this is that uh, AFP or other uh, or the, uh, automated uh, solutions are potentially ruled out unnecessarily at early stages of the project. And on the other hand, is the uh, AFP, for example, solution is not used to its full extent. We could use AFP with uh, more uh, more efficiency than it is today. And the global impact is that we don't have at the end the, the best compromise between uh, mechanical properties and production rate. Okay? And the other major uh, impact is that it's, there's a very high lead time between, uh, from the designing the part right to the, uh, to the uh, production of the first part. So 
what we, uh, what we, uh, the solution we're, we're, we're going to release at the end of the year uh, so proposes to extend this analysis and design world uh, with a solution that is embedded in, in Katia, comes out as, as an add-on to Katia Composites to extend the, the ply definition or the, the, uh, the CAD definition of the, uh, of, of the composite part with the fiber information. Okay? And so fully integra in integrated, as I said, in, in, uh, in Katia, which brings, allows to bring the manufacturing process specificities at a design stage. But it's not, the, the intention is not to create another tool for designers and then have the, the same problem uh, again and again. It's really that this solution is also uh, available for the programmers themselves. And they'll share the same data um, and not start with the, uh, with, the, with the data in Katia, then move on to, to, to Delmia in the, in the, uh, in the Dassault Systems um, platform solutions. Uh, three experiment platform solutions. And the idea is, of course, having the same data, you'll be able to converge more, more quickly on the, uh, on the thing, on the, uh, on the part. Uh, and as I said, we're very, uh, we're knowing both worlds, uh, we know that they won't be, the, the, the de designers and manufacturing programmers will not exactly use the same tools, it's the same data set, but the commands or functions that we will provide to the, uh, to each, uh, for each step will be different and specific to their, to their needs. Of course, for those who, who are familiar with the, the cat fiber solution we have today, uh, we'll complete the, uh, the, the solution with the, with the pr programming part of the solution, which will be fully embedded in, 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 in Delmia uh, and complete the, uh, the, 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 uh, the process and the chain, the numerical thread, uh, with this solution. So how will it work? So we have the solution. You'll, you'll have the, uh, the, um, the Katia Composites definition, the CPD definition, with the contours, the material, orientations, rosettes, uh, information. What we'll add to that is AFP configurations, the ability to, to test how the part can be designed for AFP and check if it can be, can be manufactured. So the AFP configurations will, be, will contain the AFP head, the main head uh, information. I haven't mentioned this, but of course, it's machine independent. I'm from Coriolis, a so machine vendor, but our solution is machine independent. The technology we have is machine independent, and we're not talking about Coriolis machines here. We're talking about AFP machines in general, so that you can assess any AFP uh, um, uh, solution for, for, your, for your part. So the, the head information, the number of, of uh, fibers, of toes, the, the width of the toes, the number of rolls, uh, the minimum, uh, minimum, uh, minimum length for, the, for, for draping, etc. Very generic uh, parameters for, for the head. And optionally, we'll come back to that, uh, the, the envelope of the head, uh, so just uh, uh, visualization uh, representation of the uh, of the head, so that you could, we can use this for uh, collision detection and, and check in the uh, right after. Material information, uh, typically, so the width is, is part of the head as well. But uh, information as for the, the steering, the, steer, the minimum steering radius, or not only just one value, it could be a law that the the steering radius for AFP can depend on the on the speed at which you you lay the uh, you lay the fibers. So this we can integrate that, so you can have a better assessment of uh, of uh, the time it will take to 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 uh, to lay the uh, the full part. Um, also, engineering parameters, or rather, pr I prefer calling parameters than rules. Rules are frozen. Parameters you can you can uh, you can modify and see the impact of these parameters. Engineering parameters, when I say parameters, is such as the deviation, for example. Usually, uh, when it comes to AFP, we're talking about minus 5 to 5 degrees maximum deviation compared to the, uh, to the, uh, the uh, theoretical orientations. So you, you'll have these, these type of uh, parameters in the configuration. Other manufacturing parameters that we could, uh, we could have as well to, to, uh, to, uh, to test the, uh, or, or evaluate the, uh, the, um, the design. And 
AFP design default parameters. The idea you'll see will be to generate uh, automatically an AFP design, but th there are some specificities in the design. You need to know where you're going to position the, uh, the short fibers, where you're, how you're going to end the, uh, the toes uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, to the contours, the ply contours, etc. So you'll have default, uh, default values set here. And this not only for one AFP configuration, but for several AFP configurations. OK, so you can have a catalog of AFP configurations that, you will, uh, that will be provided to designers. This is something that will be done by, by, uh, by experts or people who have the knowledge of the, of the AFP uh, and bring it for, for designers or um, for manufacturers. It will be the actual uh, head information that they will be using. And the idea will, have, will be to have to generate all the, all the toes, the, the tapes, the toes, uh, in addition to, on, on, on to, to add, to extend the ply definition, as I was saying, with the, with the toe information for each, uh, for each ply, and be able to, to test various AFP designs and the impact of these designs in terms of, uh, of, um, of, of quality and, and drapeability. All the analyses that are, that are uh, uh, common to for, for these uh, for these uh, for such designs, the uh, the angular deviation we mentioned, the uh, the uh, the roller crush, how how the uh, roller I would say roller contact, the uh, the uh, the steering radius, etc., the the uh, the, uh, the gap ratios, things like that, and of course. Since you'll have a better definition, a more accurate definition of the part with the, the toe information, you'll be able to, to send that information back to, the, uh, to FEA. And not only fiber orientations, but all the gap precise positions and to be able to, to, to check if having not quite respected the engineering rules that we have, uh, that you have today, how much does it impact? Because you won't, be, you won't have switched to the manufacturing world and not, you won't be actually programming the part, you'll be able to do that up front in the, uh, in the design process. And still uh, here in Katia, the ability to, to check if the design that you have, uh, that you have produced is, is actually producible with one of the heads that either you have in your company or that you, you're, you're, uh, you're considering buying or that you know is available on the market or even uh, uh, define new specificities on the not too sure the guys uh, who developed the heads will be too happy with that one but uh, on the, in Coriolis but um, it's it's what you can do the idea then will be to 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 output all the KPIs the uh, the the information saying uh, what's the maximum steering uh, the uh, the uh, the gap uh, information the ratios etc so that you can iterate with the uh, the DSO systems um, uh, optimization solutions that they have. All these, for those who are familiar with Katia, you have knowledge wear parameters. So for the results of the analysis, as well as the, uh, as the AFP configuration inputs, so you can iterate and run the, uh, the optimization loops to produce the best design that is actually producible. So what will you, if you sort of haven't got the, the, quite the, the idea. The idea is to be able to run, for, uh, to, 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 uh, run feasibility studies. If you, can you produce the part with AFP, your part with AFP? And which AFP configuration is, is the best with respect to engineering and manufacturing requirements that you have in, uh, in your company? And, the, and by optimizing the composite design, by uh, taking the AFP design into account at FEA level, as we said, and evaluating the AFP design by testing multiple uh, inputs automatically, as I said, the, the optimization loops and the optimization solutions provided by, uh, by uh, Dassault Systems on the 3D Experience platform will allow that. Again, if it's not clear, it's embedded. It's part of CATIA. It's a solution part of CATIA. Well, it's an add-on. Uh, we're, we're a partner here, a development partner, but it's embedded in the, in the, in the solution. It's not a side, uh, side solution that we have and uh, iterate, so add this AFP loop in the, uh, in the, uh, in the analysis and design uh, optimization world uh, to, to reach the best compromise uh, between, uh, between uh, mechanical properties and, and, um, and, uh, and production rate. 
So reduce time to produce, and the idea is, of course, to reduce the time to produce the first part with, uh, with AFP. So the main objectives, if we zoom out a bit uh, on this, is uh, we know all the aircraft manufacturers, the OEMs, want to reduce the time to, to produce their, 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 their next aircraft. And the uh, intention of uh, this, uh, this new cat fiber DFM design for manufacturing solution is to, to be part of, the, uh, part of the process of reducing this, uh, this, uh, this uh, design time by reducing the design to manufacturing lead time reaching the best compromise again i repeat but it's very important to uh, to uh, reach this this best compromise between mechanical properties and production rate and consider uh, automated layup uh, for additional parts so today we're focusing on afp this is our, our core our core business and and main knowledge but of course in the future we will add uh, other uh, capabilities for other automated processes and why are we credible? This is something that uh, is important for me because you might think, well, yeah, they're nice, but uh, why should we, uh, should we trust them on this? Is that the, uh, we've been developing uh, programming solutions for, for, for more than 20 years now. This is a choice that uh, Coralis has made, is to develop uh, our own solutions. Uh, it's independent, uh, machine independent technology that we have. Uh, even our cat fiber solution today could program any, any, type, of, uh, any type of machine. And we have this strong partnership for, uh, with uh, Dassault Systems since, uh, since uh, 20, uh, 2008 now. It's been a, a great partnership, and I thank, uh, thank uh, Dassault Systems for inviting me, uh, inviting Coriolis on this, uh, on this presentation. It's also uh, this solution, this cat fiber solution, is industry proven, and it's uh, available in V5 as well as in 3D experience. We have this perfect knowledge of uh, Katia Composites and its infrastructure to be able to uh, integrate our solution at best in the uh, in the in uh, the Katia world. We have all the expert the AFP experts in house to help us develop uh, stress the uh, the uh, the solution and enrich it to to make the best solution uh, possible. So as I said, the solution will be ready uh, very uh, early uh, next year, end of the year, uh, or, or sorry, uh, yeah, early next year. And I uh, so. You haven't seen a, a video here, but the solution is well advanced. I can uh, show you a, uh, uh, a demonstrator uh, on our booth. Uh, and if you're not here for the, uh, for the uh, too long for the, uh, on, the, on the show, then you can, uh, you can uh, uh, contact us, and we'll be happy to, uh, to present it to you and show you where we are in the development phase. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. It was very crystal clear, at least for me. <laughs> so the last 14 minutes, because we only have 40 minutes remaining, um, we will just now um, deep dive at the origin, the materials. So welcome, Stephen, on stage. <laughs> Introduce hey. yourself, Stephen. I will. Do I? Hey, thanks, Danielle, and uh, thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Stephen Todd and I work in Biovia, uh, the Biovia brand. I'm part of the strategy team, um, and despite that, I still actually uh, do, uh, do some other work as well, and I have some knowledge about material science. I was, uh, for a long, long time, the product manager for our, um, our atomistic simulation tools, and so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Okay, so what we've got, um, we're going to talk about going from nano to micro, uh, to macro, sorry. And I'm going to talk about multi-scale modeling first. And then if we get a little bit of time at the end, we're, we'll talk about, uh, about generative materials design as a more future looking project. Okay, so why are we interested in, uh, in trying to uh, model these materials? Well, the design space for composite materials is absolutely massive. We start off, with our carbon fiber or our glass, our filler particle and filler material in there. There's hundreds of those available. Uh, we can look at resins and thermosets and thermoplastics. There's thousands and thousands of those that you can buy commercially available at the moment. That's not including the ones that we may want to discover and generate our new materials. And then we add in performance additives. And when you bundle all of these things together, you have millions of potential materials design candidates. And that is, again, before you even start to drill down and look at 
ingredient formulation levels and things like that within once you've selected your, your different candidate materials. So there's a big, big design space for us to explore. It's simply not possible to do this using uh, experimental techniques alone. So we have to combine modeling virtual experiments with real experiments in order to uh, be able to choose the optimal composite material. So how do we do that? Well, we have a range of methods available um, for, uh, for, for doing these models, so our multi-scale models. Um, so we start off right at the bottom down here with electronic methods. Um, for, for those who are, uh, who are interested, this is more quantum mechanics, density functional theory type based methods. I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. Uh, we can then move up the size scale to classical simulations, um, commonly known as molecular dynamics, if people have heard of that. And so that enables us to look at a much a bit of a larger size scale, large my meaning now kind of tens of nanometers, not, uh, not uh, ones of, of nanometers. And then finally, we have uh, the mesoscopic scale. Um, and these are the areas, really, that Biovia plays in. And then we can connect, obviously, to our colleagues in uh, Simulia and Abacus for the finite element methods. And the methods that we have been developing at these small scales have been available, and they've been very well validated. We've worked with leading companies for the past 20 years um, to develop these, uh, these, these methods. And so, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty solid as far as, uh, as far as the science goes. Okay, so what sort of things can we, can we do here? So in a classical simulation, uh, down at the bottom size scale of a, I can't help but walk around too much. So right over here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the properties of the resin. We're gonna build a model of a resin, we're gonna cure it, and then we're gonna calculate some properties of that. We can then move up a size scale, and what we say then is, well, we don't need atoms to represent all of our individual groups, all of our, we don't need individual elements anymore. What we can do is say, well, the, the, um, one of the molecules will represent it as a bead. And when we do this, we go up a size scale, it enables us to look at larger systems, and we can look at the mesostructure and look at things like the effect of the cross-link density on the overall mesostructure of the system. And then finally, we can take these mesoscopic simulations and plug them into RVEs. So let's just quickly have a look at classical simulations in a little bit more detail. Um, so we start off um, in the process of building these things over on the left-hand side here. Um, we do some, uh, uh, some curing of our system. So we build a box which essentially contains the formulation of our resin. Um, we can put any number of different uh, resin ingredients into there. We can include tougheners and other types of materials as well. And then we use quantum mechanics calculations to define the probability that a reaction will occur when two uh, reactive groups, an epoxy and an amine, are close to each other, for example. And then once we've done that, we can simulate um, the cure as the calculation moves forward. And you can see at the top here, as it goes from red to green, green is now connected fragments. And then finally, it will go to blue and then you've got a connected, fully connected 3D network at that point. Obviously, you can see there are other bits still available in there. So once we've got that, what do we do with it? Well, it's, it's interesting in its own right in terms of being able to understand things like cross-link distances, but we really want to try and calculate some properties. So the sorts of properties that we can estimate are things like the density, uh, it's fairly easy. Um, we can run multiple density calculations and calculate a glass transition temperature for our resin, or we can calculate the coefficient of thermal expansion from that. And finally, we can calculate things like stress and strain. And you can see this as an example at the top here, showing you uh, just a uniaxial strain simulation as you're slowly pulling uh, the structure apart. And then we can also introduce the filler particle as well and we can look at the interface between the filler and the resin. And so now what we're doing um, is a different type of simulation, still molecular dynamics, but we're calculating the binding energy uh, between the two. So that gives us a way of looking at 
different cured resins on fillers and looking at how they bind to that filler. But we can also go one step further and we can pull the system apart. And this enables to see whether the failure point, for example, is going to be at the filler and resin interface or whether the failure point is going to be um, within the resin itself. So you can, uh, you can drill down to those kind of uh, nanoscopic uh, level calculations. We've already mentioned the connection, um, so I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but we can calculate um, a mesoscale density field. We can take that straight out of, um, out of our simulations, export them into um, RVE mesh models, and bring them straight into Abacus. Um, and by doing this, by doing these mesoscale calculations, what we're doing is enabling to calculate the chemical microstructure and capture that within an RVE model. So if you have um, non-homogeneous curing going on in your system, you can see that happening. You can see where the areas of crosslinks are likely to occur, where they're not likely to occur, etc. all at the mesoscale level. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand over. Cheers, Pierre. Yeah. Actually, cannot consider material structure engineering without considering the question of the material itself, because for composites, we actually build the material at the same time that we build the structures. So, for structural analysts, we look for a certain amount of margin of safety, and this margin of safety depends on what is happening on the lower scale. So, if we get back on the multi-scale analysis, particularly on composites, we consider that at every scale we will need to consider different kind of RVE, representative volume elements. So at the nanoscale, this is what just Stephen said, uh, and I won't get the details, but at the end, what we have is a reason behavior stress strain curve, in a way, that we will be involved in a structural analysis in a material building. And the resin, while it will be occurring, could have some porous materials. So we can have pores in the resin, and those pores, uh, those pores in the resin will change locally the properties. So if we consider this porous resin into uh, RVE with resin on the fibers, we will get different properties that we would have with a neat resin with no pores and the fibers. And the resin and the fibers are part generally of toes that could be uh, woven, and those toes will, will have some properties different that we have at upper scale and lower scale. And the woven patterns is involved in the structural design. So we have a different RVE being existing at the various scales. Why do we need the several scales? It's just because uh, we will not be able to see the same things at all the scales. If we consider um, a very simple RVE, uh, you will not have the view of the stress distribution. So you could miss a part of the margin of safety looking at this. Having a look to several modeling at the same time, again, on the micro scale, will give you the standard deviation, but also, uh, sorry, the mean value, but also the standard deviation. And as you do a structural can design, using the mean value, but taking into account the, the, the standard deviation you get on the mature properties, it's a way to get a better understanding of the material and get a better margin of safety on your structures. And we will see different things at the different scale. Using our product in the 3D experience platform and especially the generative design tools, uh, you can consider the materials at all the scales. So going back to the model we had before, we can get into the structures at all the scales to consider the values RVE we will need for the design of that structures. So going down, we will retrieve the RVE for random fibers distribution because uh, we need for the fiber, we need a random model. Using the hexagonal unit cell is really basic because it's easy to design this RV, but it's not delivering accuracy on the mechanical properties. So you need to be able to capture with modeling capabilities the real microstructures of your material at all the scales. So we can retrieve the Mosinus pores. We can have fibers which are not necessarily just rounded. You can have fibers which are a bit elliptic section, and we will have woven also the same way. So going through the scale and moving from bottom to top, we can have a very good accuracy of the margin of safety to consider 
for the structural analysis that we can uh, be doing in the Stephen structure concept I've shown before. So using the material properties, changing the volume fraction, changing the number of fiber, changing uh, the fiber shape, uh, changing the curing process, because you can choose the curing process on the top already. You can have a different stress concentration. That we want, again, to consider for each laminate over the structures. And as we do these structures, we won't have actually the same material properties all along the structures because the thickness is changing. And to capture that, you can have physical results for all the parts of your structures, or you want to define different laminate having different material with different properties locally. So just a step back to show you how it is working from the nano to the macro. So we can compute with this micromechanical model more advanced properties. It takes more times than just analytical solution. But at the end, what we need is to use the uh, iterative process uh, to uh, make working a multi scale analysis to store that in the database and using possibly deep learning and any other solution that Stephen could talk about if you have remaining time. Uh, no. Yeah, I don't think we have any time. OK, <laughs> we should stop then. I'm sorry I've been too long. I just would like to thank development team, because we don't see some of the development team on stage uh, presenting the new feature, new capabilities of the platform. But it exists also, because development team is working to make it real. So thank you to all the team I have the chance working with. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pierre-Yves. So we are running out of time, but I hope you learned a lot of things. At least you know, I'm, a, I'm a stupid Katia user. Uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Thanks for the audience. Um, it was long, but I, I hope again you enjoyed it. Thanks to our speakers. Um, thank you. Uh, can you applaud? <laughs> <laughs> if you have any question, feel free to stop by our booth. It's on all six B, as the Bernard 32. You are uh, welcome, uh, and we'll be there to answer all your questions. And if I just make a conclusion, because I have 45 seconds, Remember that what you saw here is a complete coverage of the process, starting from Stephen in silico material engineering, to concept, to preliminary, to detail, to simulation of the process, to the simulation of the part in service, to the manufacturing, to the simulation of the manufacturing, fully integrated on the 3D experience platform. It does allow us, and you, not us, you, to really harvest collective intelligence. Every actor of the chain, even the, the guy, you know, looking at the vacuum system on the, on the shop floor, can give, uh, can, can have his voice, can be listened, and update and optimize the global process. This is really the beauty of our platform and our solution. And I really encourage you to have a look. And even if you are a SolidWorks user, you can use the platform, you can keep your, solid, your nice SOLIDWORKS CAD tool and use CATIA to complement your SOLIDWORKS CAD tool to do, hopefully, very light-weighted parts. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, at least for me. A stupid CATIA user, but I like composite. <laughs>